Last time, we talked about organic compounds and how adding functional groups or other types of atoms to carbon and hydrogen can help make molecules more interesting. From here, we're going to go on to talk about some different types of organic compounds or different classes of organic compounds that are important in living things. I'd like to start with the carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are important as an energy source for cells. Their most important function is probably just that, short-term energy, although they do have some structural functions as well. When we look at the structure of carbohydrates, carbohydrates contain carbon, hydrogen, and a lot of oxygen. Those oxygen molecules make carbohydrates very polar, so they dissolve easily in water. The basic unit, or monomer, of carbohydrates is the monosaccharide. Mono means one, and saccharide means sugar, so this is a single sugar. Let's take a closer look at the structure of a monosaccharide. You can see a number of different monosaccharides shown on the screen, and they all have some things in common. To build a monosaccharide, what you have to do is start with a chain of carbon atoms, three to seven carbon atoms in a row. Next, we add one carbonyl group. Remember that a carbonyl group is a double bonded oxygen, so I'm going to have a double bonded oxygen attached to one of these carbons. Then, the remaining carbons all get a hydroxyl group. Remember that a hydroxyl group is an oxygen with a hydrogen. Finally, remembering that carbon likes to make four covalent bonds, we add hydrogens to fill in all the extra spaces so that every carbon has four covalent bonds. And there you have it, a basic monosaccharide. A monosaccharide has a chain of carbons, a lot of hydroxyl groups, one carbonyl. One of the things to note about monosaccharide structure is that the location of the hydroxyl groups and the hydrogens does matter. So the way I drew this monosaccharide, I have one particular structure. If I switch the location of one of these hydroxyl groups, I have a molecule that has the same molecular formula, the same number of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, but now the atoms are in a slightly different arrangement. Do you remember what we call molecules that have the same molecular formula but a different arrangement of the atoms? They're isomers. It may look like a really small difference, but different isomers of monosaccharides do have different functions. One important example is that of D-glucose. D-glucose is the most important sugar in our bodies. It's the main source of energy for cells. And the structure looks like this on the screen. If we make one tiny change and move this hydroxyl group to the other side, it's now L-glucose. L-glucose is a useless molecule that our bodies can't do anything with. So a really tiny change can go from an isomer that's the most important carbohydrate in the body to an isomer that can't do anything at all. But don't worry, I don't expect you to recognize different isomers of monosaccharides. I just want you to be able to recognize the general structure of a monosaccharide. One more important thing about the structure of monosaccharides is that sometimes they're found in this linear form, like I've drawn here and like what's shown on the screen right now. But in water, carbohydrates tend to take a more stable ring form. The way that works is that one of the oxygens in a hydroxyl group reaches around to bond to one of the other carbons, and this is going to form a ring. On the screen, you can see the linear form of glucose, and then you can see how if one of the oxygens reaches around and bonds to one of the carbons near the end, we form a ring structure. And so a lot of times when we're looking at monosaccharides, instead of looking linear like this, they look like a ring. In order to recognize the ring form of a monosaccharide, you're really looking for the same sorts of characteristics. Only instead of a line of carbons, you've got a ring of carbons with a lot of hydroxyl groups on it. 
There are a few important monosaccharides that I want you to know the functions or importance of. And the first one we've mentioned already is glucose. Glucose is important because it is the most important energy source in your cells. It's also the main component of a lot of more complex carbohydrates that we'll see shortly. The molecular formula of glucose is C6H12O6. The second monosaccharide I want to point out is galactose. And you can see that it has a very similar structure to glucose. Galactose also has a molecular formula of C6H12O6. So that makes it an isomer of glucose. Galactose is an isomer of glucose that our bodies can use for energy. And galactose is a monosaccharide that's found in dairy products and some legumes. The third monosaccharide I want you to know about is also an isomer of glucose. It has the molecular formula C6H12O6. Only in this particular monosaccharide, fructose, the carbonyl group, instead of being on the end carbon, is a little bit further down. This changes the shape of the monosaccharide quite a bit. And, most interesting to me, it changes how this monosaccharide fits on the sweet receptors on your tongue. So fructose, with its slightly different carbonyl, slightly different shape, is a sweeter sugar to taste than glucose is. Fructose is found in sweet things like fruits and honey. The last monosaccharide I want to point out is not an isomer of glucose. It's actually a shorter sugar. It has a molecular formula of C5H10O5, and that is the sugar ribose. The reason ribose is important is because ribose is a component of our nucleic acids. Those would be the RNA and DNA that we find in our cells. Without ribose, we don't have RNA and DNA, and our cells would definitely not work. Monosaccharides are interesting on their own, but they're not the only type of carbohydrate that I want you to know about. I also want you to know about some disaccharides. Disaccharides are formed by joining two monosaccharides together. And the monosaccharides are joined together by a dehydration reaction. That means we have two monosaccharides. They're joined together by removing a molecule of water. Remember that this is an anabolic reaction that's going to require energy if we're going to make a disaccharide. There are two disaccharides that I want you to know about. The first one is sucrose. Sucrose is formed by a dehydration reaction between one glucose molecule and one fructose molecule. Because of the fructose, sucrose is a sweet sugar. Sucrose is what we refer to as plain sugar. Plain table sugar is actually sucrose. It's a disaccharide of glucose and fructose. The other sugar is lactose. Lactose is formed by a dehydration reaction between one glucose and one galactose. Lactose is the main sugar in milk. When we consume disaccharides as part of our diet, whether we're eating sugar on our cereal or drinking milk and getting lactose, those disaccharides go into our digestive system and have to be broken down back into individual monosaccharides before they can be absorbed. The reaction that breaks a disaccharide down into monosaccharides is a hydrolysis reaction. We break those apart by adding a molecule of water, and that's a catabolic reaction that's breaking something down. There are specific enzymes that help that process work faster. Sucrase is the enzyme that breaks down sucrose, and lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. People who are lactose intolerant don't make enough of the enzyme lactase. Without the lactase, you can't break down the lactose, and it goes down in the large intestine, where bacteria can ferment it and produce gases and acids that cause the uncomfortable symptoms of people who have lactose intolerance. But disaccharides aren't the end of the story. We can start putting even more monosaccharides together to form bigger molecules called polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are formed by dehydration reactions between lots of monosaccharides. You can have hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of glucose molecules all strung together to make polysaccharides. Poly means many, so these are many sugars strung together. There are a few polysaccharides I want you to know about. I don't need you to recognize their structure, but I want you to know what they're important for. And the first one is glycogen. 
Glycogen is a polysaccharide of glucose, hundreds of glucoses all strung together, that has a really branching structure. So we've got these branching chains of glucose going out all over. Glycogen is the main form of stored glucose in animal cells. So when you consume a lot of glucose, different cells in your body, especially muscle cells and your liver, take in the extra glucose and they string it together into these branching chains of glycogen. And you store the glucose in your liver and your muscle cells until you need it, and then we break down the glycogen and release individual glucose molecules back into the blood. Starch serves a very similar function in plants. Starch is the main form of stored glucose in plant cells. Starch comes in a couple of different forms, including amylose, which is a long chain with very few branches, and amylopectin, which branches more like glycogen. So starch stores glucose in plants, and glycogen stores glucose in animals. The third type of polysaccharide is cellulose. Cellulose is a major component of plant cell walls. The downside of cellulose is that humans cannot digest cellulose. The way the glucose molecules are linked together gives the bonds a little bit different shape, and we don't have the enzymes necessary to break those apart. So we cannot use cellulose as a source of glucose to give us energy. However, that doesn't mean that cellulose is useless to us. Cellulose is also known as fiber, and it's an important part of our diet, not because it gives us energy, but because it improves the health of our digestive system. It provides bulk and absorbs a lot of water to help things move through the digestive system smoothly. It helps prevent things like constipation or diarrhea. And some doctors describe it as being a sort of molecular sponge that can clean out the inside of the colon and reduce the risk of colon cancer.